Hi, I'm Carter Clues, the Director of Communications at Judicial Watch, and I want to welcome you to Inside Judicial Watch. Today we're honored to have with us a one of the top investigators at Judicial Watch, a senior investigator, Bill Marshall. Um, at Judicial Watch, everything starts with the investigation because we make sure we have the facts in a row before we go into court, and, um, and we should appreciate your support in that. Um, Bill had not just one but two of his own private investigation firms. He has a wealth of experience. He was a intelligence analyst with the DEA, one of their top people, and um, conducted investigations or took part in investigations in 40 different countries, uh, some of which probably you and I would not have cared to go into, but he did. We're grateful for it and we're grateful for the stellar work he does at Judicial Watch. Bill. Welcome to Inside Judicial Watch. Thank you, Carter. Glad to be here. Huma Abedin. Huma Abedin. I think all of our supporters know her name well. Um, Hillary's top aide. Hillary's top aide. Her personal aide, professional aide. Been with her for years. Uh, I have to confess that when I was talking to Michael Bakesha, who we've had on Inside Judicial Watch before, I said to him that after reading thousands of pages of her um, uh, emails that I thought maybe she was a bit naive, maybe she was used by Hillary and Cheryl Mills. Michael said, Carter, you've got it exactly wrong. Uh, when I talked to you, uh, you said, Michael's right. Do you want to share with us how you, after, I think you've read 25,000 pages of her emails, is that right? It's, you know, I haven't added them up, uh, but it, we, we've gotten, we just finished our uh, 20, gotten our 20th production from uh, the State Department uh, of the of Huma's emails. That, these are emails, of course, that were taken off of her non-State Department uh, email account. This is Hillary Clinton's account. Uh, and it, it's on the order of 20,000, uh, 20, 25,000, I would estimate, yeah, that we've looked at. Some, some of the productions contain uh, more emails, you know, a couple of thousand. Others have, you know, five or six or seven hundred. So, uh, yeah, in total, it's probably about And your feeling is that uh, she was not someone who was naive and used, that no. she was a kingpin. Is that, I, am I characterizing that correctly? Uh, one of the things you have to remember about Huma, it, it's a fascinating relationship that she has with Hillary, right? Uh, and, and, this, and, and anyone who really knows the Clintons will tell you that she is more, much more of a daughter to Hillary than, than just an aide. This is, this is someone who is uh, intimately familiar with, with Hillary's um, requirements, her professional needs, her personal needs, frankly, you know, in terms of uh, catering to her every whim. Uh, but one of the things that really comes through is really striking, and particularly in this most recent production, which we'll be uh, releasing s shortly. Probably this week, so watch for it. Yeah, it contains what I, what I thought was really uh, stunning um, information, um, communications which suggests that Huma was almost uh, um, feeding information to Hillary to repeat, you know, pa to parrot. And, and, and it'll be obvious to the readers when, when they see what we'll be releasing. Um, I, think, I think that Michael is right. Michael's done outstanding work, by the way, as, uh, as our attorney in getting these records. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it's very much a team effort, of course, at Judicial Watch. And um, the, you know, these records just sh seem to show that Huma played an outsized role at the State Department in terms of uh, her influence on Hillary and, you know, for someone who's just a young aide uh, of an administrative yeah. type, you know, walk. Her, her influence on Hillary and the, what some would probably call the pay for play between Hillary's State Department and the Clinton Foundation. In fact, the first time you and I, I think, worked together extensively, I, I have the release, the August 22nd news release, August 22nd. Some of you may have actually received this. If not, I can pretty well assure you, you saw it covered in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, USA Today, Fox everywhere. This is the news release that, thanks to you, your investigation, your investigation broke open the connection between contributions to the Clinton Foundation and favors granted to major contributors through Huma Abedin. Right, 
Right. Can you elucidate on that a little bit for us? Sure. In that particular release, we, we see the Crown Prince of Bahrain, Prince Salman, I believe, uh, who um, wanted a meeting uh, in a fairly short time frame with a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Hillary. And we see that he contacted, uh, he reached out to her through official State Department channels to try to get a meeting, but they essentially put him off. So what he then did, and this is a man who had donated, or has donated, $32 million uh, to the Clinton Foundation. $32 million right. to the Clinton. Could not, but even as the Crown Prince, couldn't get in to see the Secretary of State. Right. So what he does is he goes through his, uh, he goes through the, what I would say is the financial route. He goes to the contacts Doug Band who was, of course, a top official at the Clinton Foundation. He ran, Doug Bain ran the Clinton Foundation. Right, right. He, right? He, okay. And he was, he was their money man. He was, the, he, was their, he was the guy who was responsible for raising the huge sums of money for the Clinton Foundation and setting up the meetings with the various donors and whatnot. So, so Prince Salman contacts Doug Band. Doug Band then says, contacts Huma and says, uh, you know, he needs this meeting. He's a good friend of ours. He's now, a good friend when, when, of ours. Yeah, when, and when he says... <laughs> he's, when he's a good, good, rich friend of ours. Right. And of course, when he says ours, you have to wonder, well, is he talking about the State Department? Is he talking about the Clinton Foundation? Is he talking about the Clintons personally? And I would argue that it's all the same. You know, they it's had, all the same. The, the Hillary had so melded the State Department with the Clinton Foundation that they were virtually, I would say, inseparable at, at the very highest levels. And so then within 48 hours, Prince Salman got a meeting with, uh, with, with Hillary. He got his meeting. Let's, uh, he got his meeting. So there's 32 million. Let's talk about Danny Wasserman. Danny Wasserman, I think the grandson of Lou Wasserman, man, the king of Hollywood. Danny obviously a lot, uh, uh, inherited a lot of power and money. Uh, Danny gave, according to the Clinton Foundation, five to 10 million right. to the Clinton Foundation. So what happened when, when Danny came to Huma. Right, right. Well, actually, there's two, there's, there's two individuals. There's Danny uh, Abraham and Casey Wasserman, but both are very Did <laughs> similar. Did I say Abraham and uh, yeah. Wasserman? Yeah. But, but, but I'll, Wasserman. I'll, I'll discuss me. both of them. Right. Yeah. Uh, in, that, in that same production of records, we see, uh, we see Danny Abraham, who was the founder of uh, Slim, Fast. Slim Fast, right. uh, who donated five to $10 million. He wants a meeting the next, I believe, the next day with Hillary. He emails Huma, and within you know within a, a short amount of time, the next day he has a meeting with the secretary. Now of let's State. be clear: Danny Abraham is not a diplomat. He's not a member of Congress. He is not a an ambassador. Right, right. He is a man who donated five to ten millions to, to the Clinton Foundation. Huma got to see the secretary of state, got to see Hillary, and. Right, and uh, and then you know things things happen when you when you grease the the Clintons' palms, uh, magic happens, and that the same was true of uh, Casey Wasserman, who, as you noted, is a uh, he's a media mogul, a sports entertainment mogul in, in Hollywood. Casey, and, right? And, and Casey contacted uh, Hillary because one of uh, someone had contacted him from the the I believe was the owner of the uh, Wolverhampton Football Club, the big soccer club in England. Right. And right. uh, that one of their players wanted to come to Las Vegas for a celebrity break, right? You know, a little vacation. But he was having trouble getting a visa to come to the United States because of a criminal charge in his past. So Casey Wasserman was helping out, I guess, his friend who owned the, the, the football club so that to get this soccer star a, you know, a, a visa to come to the U.S. Uh, they said, can you, you know, so, so do contacts Doug Band. Doug Band then immediately contacts Huma and says, you know, can we make this happen? Huma says, and there's a very interesting line in that email exchange between Huma and Doug where, where Huma says, uh, this makes me nervous, but I'll try. Now, as any lawyer, I think, would tell you, if something makes you nervous, that, that you know, uh, denotes uh, 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 guilty knowledge or, or a, uh, 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 a guilty mind, I should say. Um, <laughs> that it's probably something they shouldn't be doing, right? So I think this, so even, even Huma admits in uh, email communications that she's, you know, engaging in something that's probably unethical. You know, a so. member of a soccer team wants to come to the U.S., has nothing to do with diplomacy, and his buddy, who's contributed five to ten million to the Clinton Foundation, mm -hmm. hey, Huma, get my buddy into the country here, get him a special visa, 
Don, I'm trying to get a visa for my fiance. It's not very easy. I guess I should have given the five to ten million. Right, right. And she'd, we be, she'd be sitting on the other side. And these are just a few of the probably hundreds of examples we've we've seen of this sort of pay for play in, uh, you know, in within the the Huma uh, communication stream with Hillary. One of the, one of the ones I found kind of. Uh, it, there, there were actually there were some funny ones. You know, Bono contacted Hillary Bono. because he wanted a satellite uplink for his concert tours. He wanted Hillary as the Secretary of State to arrange uh, <laughs> he you know, wanted his satellite broadcast on the space station. Days. Yes, yes. And this there is, we go. This is the, the kind of thing that. And he was uh, a contributor to the Clinton Initiative. Oh, yeah, he was. Yeah, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he. Uh, he put on concerts for the Clinton uh, Global Initiative. I'd have to you know, double check that, but I, that's, uh, you know, that, that, that's the kind of thing that... Um, Bill, there's one here that is in some ways particularly bothersome. Um, a gentleman by the name of, uh, let's see, it's Rajiv, Rajiv, Rajiv Fernando. Fernando. Right. Now, Rajiv wanted to be appointed to the International Security Advisory Board. Right. They deal with non-proliferation of nuclear weapons and such. Right. On the website of that organization, they say that the members are national security experts. <laughs> uh, Rajiv gave a million to uh, the Clinton Foundation. Uh, right. How big of an expert is Rajiv on? Right. Well, that what was interesting about that. One of the things that we uncovered, I think, in, from these records. Uh, it, it, it had been known that, uh, that Rajiv Fernando, at some point it was learned that he had no expertise at all in national security issues. And he wasn't appointed until 2011. What, what these records showed was that they were lobbying to get him this position since 2009, I believe. So you have... With Hillary. Uh, with, yeah, through, with Abedin, through, through Hillary, through yeah, to, to get this position on this national security board. Uh, which, which, you know, which really begs the question, uh, was Hillary willing to, to uh, you know, sacrifice U.S. national security in order to please f donors? And I don't think any, that's a real question. I think that was, uh, you know, that was fairly, you know, that was pretty clear from all the records we've seen. So we have massive, massive fraud. Hillary's new book coming out, What Happened? Maybe what really happened is some of what, what Bill was able to, to unearth through his investigations. Let's move from Foggy Bottom in Washington to Minneapolis, Minnesota, a section known as uh, Little Somalia. Uh, tell us about the mysterious explosion that occurred there and in some ways the, the even more mysterious non-investigation of it. Right, right. You know, when I joined uh, Judicial Watch about four years ago, one of the things that, uh, that hit me early on uh, was this, this, this explosion that occurred. One of the things that had been bothering me was this explosion that occurred on January 1st, 2014 in a small apartment building in Minneapolis that was owned by a Somali immigrant um, who, uh, who had been placed on the U.S. terror watch list in 2001, shortly after 9-11. Um, he owned a money transmitting business called Tawakal Express, which uh, these are known as Hawalas. I, I come from a um, when I was in the DEA, I was a money laundering specialist, and I had some experience in the movement of, of illicit proceeds and, uh, and, and international uh, uh, through international channels. And one of the methods that were that has been uh, documented in, in the um, in the world of money laundering are, is the use of these Muslim-based Hawala operations. These are very um, uh, sort of clandestine. Um, typically uh, routes of moving money typically without a lot of paperwork being generated right they're they're a big cause of concern in the drug trafficking world but also in the uh, terror financing world and he was implicated his business Tawakal Express was implicated in uh, in moving money to terrorist groups overseas so he was placed on the US terror watch list uh, and his apartment building that he owned exploded mysteriously on January 1st, 2014, about 8.15 in the morning. Uh, and it, what bugged me about that case was that it was, it's, it appeared to be quickly shut down by law enforcement authorities in, uh, in Minneapolis. And I, you know, they, they blamed it, they blamed the, the, the blast on a, um, a natural gas leak. But they really never had any solid evidence proving that. In fact, the, the arson investigators of the Minneapolis Fire Department and the State Fire Marshal both listed the causes undetermined. 
and uh, and I think the the uh, the utilities department. Center Point said, Energy denied that uh, absolutely denied that it was a gas leak that caused um, the explosion. They found no fugitive gas present in the soil when they tested the soil, which is which is typical to find uh, right. due to a natural gas caused leak. Uh, I, I sent out, I think, 21 records requests to everybody from the FBI to the ATF to the Homeland Security at the federal level, plus uh, you know the state fire marshal at the state level, Minneapolis Fire Department, Minneapolis Police Department. I got voluminous records, including street camera videos that captured the explosion from the various um, street cameras that the police department has set up in Minneapolis. Uh, I got the, the photos of the victims. There were three people killed in the blast, uh, two immediately and one died later in the hospital a couple of days later. Six people were critically injured, another six had minor injuries. Massive explosion. A, a very large explosion that completely demolished this, you know, this is a small apartment block, maybe ten apartments. The victims, they were immediately killed. One of them was actually uh, bifurcated. He was, he was blown in half. And I, you could see, it's difficult to make out from the charred remains, but you can see that this individual's torso has been separated from his, his lower half. What that, even as a layman, that is an, a person not expert in you know, explosions, um, the, the, it, raises, it raises a question of what exactly caused this blast. From speaking to uh, arson investigators myself, typically natural gas caused blasts uh, are, sl are more diffuse explosions, whereas um, that are explosions that are result from other other causes like bombs and so forth uh, are high, what they call high velocity explosions, and they protect, they have different effects on bodies. So, so what what we're saying here is there very possibly, maybe even likely, could have been terrorist activity. But what happened when the ATF went out to? Check out what's going on here. Well, this, what, what happened? This was the most alarming aspect of this to me. I was able to get email communications between the ATF officers in, in uh, Minneapolis. Now, these are, they have the best arson and explosives investigators in the world. Federal government. The yeah. federal government does. Yeah. They had a team all set um, to go into that crime, uh, that incident scene, and do a thorough analysis of it to try to determine the cause. And you can see from the email exchanges that the group supervisor at the ATF who was assembling this team had them all ready to go when he suddenly sends a communication to his, uh, to his subordinates that we've been told that our services won't be needed, that the city is already in the process of demolishing the, the scene. Um, now, what I've been told by, uh, by you know, experts that I consulted is that typically in, in these types of incidents, what you do is you shore up the remains of the, build, of, the, of the building to make sure it doesn't endanger anyone, and then you have your investigators go in and sift through the evidence. What Minneapolis, the city of Minneapolis did, was that they, within hours of pulling the last body out of the rubble, they called in an excavator to demolish the scene. So they blocked the ATF, then they yes. demolished the scene, yes. end of investigation, we may never know what really happened. Right, and the FBI was reportedly, according to media reports, was looking into the backgrounds of the, uh, you know, of the occupants and so forth. When I sent a, a, rec a records request to the, the FBI asking for their communications, they told us we don't have any communications, which I couldn't believe because the media reports you know, indicated that the, the special agent in charge of the FBI office there told the media that they were investigating this issue. So then we, uh, our lawyer in that case, you know, we appealed it. We said, uh, you know, we, we don't accept that. Uh, then we asked, well, did you check for communications among the local, um, you know, the FBI staff? And, and he absolutely said, oh, no, we didn't look for those. Which begs the question, well, what did you think our FOIA request meant when we asked for all communications of the FBI? Right. So they said, well, we'll go back in and look. Well, they produced 54 pages of records. Uh, they blacked them out entirely. Blacked them out entirely. That's what's right. known, I think that's what's known as a possible cover-up. Right now, they, they <laughs> well, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to get into their motivations, what their or possible motivations, but it does make you wonder uh, what, why couldn't they release this information to us? If the, if this, if this was a natural it's gas caused gas explosion, explosion yeah. just a natural gas explosion, why not release them to us? Unfortunately, we are. This is going very quickly because it's very it, it has. Oh, there's so many cases we can talk agree. about. It's here. extremely fascinating, these investigations. But we have some questions from that have come in through Twitter, Facebook. Um, 
One of them is, what, please tell us about the Satanic Club of, uh, I think, Tacoma. Right. The, uh, you know, I, 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 I sort of hold a view that, you know, Judicial Watch is known for looking at big issues like Benghazi and the IRS targeting of conservative groups and Hillary Clinton's emails. And these are, you know, these are very important issues. But I also, and I'm involved in a lot of those, but I also enjoy looking at more of the culture war sort of issues, the cultural issues, because I think that corruption at the highest levels of our government starts at the lowest levels, meaning even our education system, even our elementary school. This is where the corruption of our values occurs, uh, which then leads to people in positions of power who are themselves corrupt. So I, you know, when I saw an opportunity to uh, look into a case in which a, an elementary school in the state of Washington, called Point, uh, Point Defiance Elementary, was launching an after-school Satan club. Satan club. Satan club, as in devil, devil, you know, uh, worship, uh, which is I think is alarming. I mean, for on a number of levels, obviously, but um, it, what it involved was a um, was a was a group in uh, Massachusetts that that. Worship Satan. It's called the Reason Alliance, um, who who decided to fight a court order which allowed Good News clubs. These are religious uh, Christian evangelical clubs to form to be set up in various uh, various schools to counter that by setting up um, these Satan clubs. Uh, the court ruled in favor of the satanic, you know, the uh, of of they. I should say the 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 the, the schools felt they couldn't fight. It couldn't object to these Satan clubs because of the court ruling. So you have, uh, in Point Defiance, you had this club um, set up called, um, you know, it was an after-school Satan club uh, by the Satanic Temple of Seattle, I believe, was the sponsoring organization. But what, what, I, what, what, what I was most curious about was how long it took the Reason Alliance to get its tax-exempt status. Because you may remember... Well, this, this is fascinating. Yeah, you may remember that the Tea Party groups back in, you know, 2010, 11, 12, were, were effectively uh, had their, their applications for a tax exempt status from the IRS halted, you know, through log rolling and, uh, uh, and that sort of thing. So I, I, I contacted the IRS and I got the, um, the tax exempt uh, exemption application for the Reason Alliance, this Massachusetts based organization that was sponsoring these satanic clubs. You know how long it took them to get their tax exempt status? 10 days. 10 days. 10 days after applying. The tea parties have waited years and yes. it took a satanic club. Yes. The IRS handed them a tax in 10 in, days. In 10 days. Yep. They get fast tracked. They got fast tracked. Unfortunately, we are out of time. We are out of time and it's just been, I know it's been fascinating for me. It always is. Uh, we appreciate your joining us. We appreciate the more than 500 investigations uh, you've conducted for Judicial Watch and continue to do so. And we appreciate your support in helping make all this possible. Thank you for joining us, Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. It was great.